Made in New Orleans is underwritten by Art Plus Design Magazine, New Orleans Auction Galleries, and New Orleans Living Magazine. Welcome to Made in New Orleans. I'm Steve Martin. Thank you for joining us. Each week we highlight local artists and their work. Tonight we're joined by photographer Richard Sexton and by Deanne Martin of Windsor Fine Art. First, let's learn some more about Richard in this vignette. Well, I grew up in a small town in uh, southwest Georgia, farming community. We didn't have any art museums, we didn't have art galleries. I mean, there was none of that in a town of 1,800 people. But we did have the big picture magazines that my parents subscribed to, Life and Look and all the others. And I think really that's what piqued my interest in photography and in becoming a photographer. And then um, as an adult, I, I started my career, I was briefly in art school in San Francisco. I lived there for 13 years. Moved to New Orleans in 1991, and at that point, I was pretty established as a commercial photographer, and that's really what I did for a great number of years. And uh, really through my books, which were commercial in a sense, but they were uh, bigger projects, they were projects that in most cases I originated, and um, they gave me an opportunity to uh, choose my own subjects. Uh, and that was important. And uh, that eventually led to me becoming primarily a fine art photographer today. I'm basically known for three subjects. Uh, architecture, landscape, and still life. It's kind of everything but people. You know, I'm not known for my portraiture. So I think that the commonality of all of those subjects is they lend themselves to a methodical approach, kind of a studied approach. Buildings make for very patient subjects, uh, and typically so do landscapes. And I've always described myself this way. I say I'm the laziest expatriate on earth because I haven't had to leave the United States except in spirit. And that's the real essence of uh, my interest and love of New Orleans. I love it for its otherness, the fact that it's not like all the other places in the United States. And uh, I think that understanding and the interest in uh, the subject matter here, in the old architecture and uh, the Creole part of the city, I mean, that's really uh, the, the heart of my interest. I like things that are imperfect. I don't like perfect things. If I, you know, uh, Warhol said, I like boring things. Well, I like imperfect things. And in that imperfection, there is a lot of history, a lot of a sense of what has happened to that place, that building, that object across time. And that, that tends to be my major focus in, in what I'm doing. All of those subjects are highly cooperative in terms of that slow, methodical, almost painterly in the sense of the time frame. I think with photography, one of the beautiful things about it is a single photograph is relatively easy to take. And because of that, you can do a lot of different ones. You can explore a subject from several different angles, several, several different ways, and then you can combine several photographs to tell a story when the light is right, when certain things fall into place. And that's what I'm always looking at. When I see something for the first time, I think, oh, that's a great subject. Now, when is the light going to be perfect? What time of year is important? Our time of day? All of that. And then when those conditions are present, I go back to it and photograph. So I've planned it. And 
I may go back to it two or three or four times over the course of a year to see what the light is like and then try to time the very best uh, uh, time to take a photograph of it. I began photography in the early 70s. Over that time, and particularly in the last decade, photography has changed entirely. The technology behind it is totally different now. For those people seeking to earn a living in photography and being accepted as important, significant artists, you've really got to be uh, exploring subject matter that is very special and you've got to be doing it in a very special way. And uh, if you do that, I think you, you'll always be um, uh, successful at what you do. And now we're back and we're with Richard Sexton. Richard, thank you very much for coming into the Thanks studio. Thanks for having me. Um, you're our first photographer, so I want to really talk about a lot of things that we haven't discussed on the show before. Um, but first, why don't we start with where you started, your childhood. Well, I grew up in a small town in southwest Georgia, farming community, about 1,800 people. And uh, my first exposure to photography there, I think, was um, uh, the big picture magazines. Of course, in a small town like that, you don't have any art museums, art galleries, or any of that. And uh, that was what initially got me interested in photography, I think. So life and look and, and National all Geographic. Those. All of those. Yeah, all yeah of same those. thing I would yes. when I was a kid. Right. Um, of those magazines, or, or in, in general, that type of, of exposure, what elements do you see now in your work that are a carryover from your childhood experience in, in looking at those big pictures? Well, I think... Um, I was always intrigued by the, uh, some of the locales that were photographed. And when you think of life and look, in a lot of cases it was uh, a little bit closer to home. Some of the other things, uh, like natural, National Geographic, of course, very far flung. And I guess for me, I was always more interested in the uh, more travel-oriented things in a way. But uh, it was also just the way the photographs work together on the printed page to tell a story. Um, I, I think that uh, the photo essay for me was always um, an integral part of it to anything that I did. I was interested in telling stories with photographs. Right. Now, a lot of people that we've talked to here on the show uh, are accidental artists. They, they did, didn't start out that way. W were you deliberate? How did you get involved in photography? Well. I would say I'm accidental too, and, and, and maybe still am, because I'm really a photographer, I think. Uh, and I also write in conjunction, because that's part of the storytelling part of it. Uh, sometimes it takes word and image together to uh, get your point across. But I never really thought of myself as an artist, truthfully. I mean, I was a photographer. And I have always said that this kind of this ongoing battle within me between the uh, photojournalist and the artist, because I, I don't do pure photojournalism, or what we would think of as that, or a documentary, or reportage, there are different ways of describing it. And I'm not a purist in really any of those, I don't guess. But there is something of that tradition in my work. And I'm, I'm certainly don't try to create um, imaginary things. Like a lot of photographers, or artists, I should say, really like to take you to another place. Uh, and not necessarily a literal, real kind of place. I'm, I've always been about reality. Gotcha. Well, art um, and photography are, are coming together. Before you mentioned that it, you were a photographer, but photography is now considered a major art form and it's shown in galleries and it's shown in, in different venues and museum collections now are, are bringing photography into their galleries. Um, wh what was your big photo debut uh, in, in the art 
related side of things? Well, I really didn't have uh, my first major museum exhibit until pretty far into my career, and it was, uh, I guess around 2005, I um, had my first uh, exhibit at uh, Ogden Museum of Southern Art here in New Orleans. Now, I'd been in other shows uh, here and there, but there were group shows. I'd not had an exhibit of my own, and that show was based on really a, a little sideline project that I did where um, I was always going back and forth uh, to uh, southwest Georgia where I grew up. And I made that trip so many times that I started photographing road signs along the way. Right. So I did a handmade art book. The road signs were my travel pictures and sort of my interpretation of them, a reaction to them that became the uh, travelogue. And um, that was the basis for the first exhibit. And then since then, there have been others, primarily with Terry Incognita, which was a book that uh, I did in 2007, Black and White Landscapes of the Gulf Coast. Um, and that's an exhibit that still is traveling today, and, and a much bigger exhibit. Right. So traveling has been an, uh, a real part of, of your your whole journey in, in this, but when, when did you come to New Orleans and start actually putting down roots here? I came, I moved here from San Francisco in 1991, and uh, so have been here ever since. And when I arrived, I, I had been doing books in San Francisco. I'd done three, uh, although uh, the third one wasn't actually out yet until I actually had arrived in New Orleans. So uh, because I did that and because I didn't have any clients in uh, New Orleans for commercial work, I didn't have any gallery affiliations, none of that. Um, I, but I did have this book project that mm -hmm. I sort of arrived with and that was New Orleans Elegance and Decadence and that was the first uh, book that I did on a Louisiana subject. Okay, and that book is, is uh, still in print and has Still hit a major uh, milestone that you can tell us about right now? Sure. Uh, it was published first in 1993, and uh, the fall of 1993 debuted at, at Art for Art's sake, and that was 20 years ago, and the book is still in print. It's been through two editions, the first edition, and then there was a revised edition in 2003. There have been uh, 10 printings, and we've sold about 90,000 books to this point, and it's still going. And that's pretty amazing for a, book, a coffee table book on photography, isn't it? It's extremely rare to be around that long, because usually these kinds of books, unless they're a retrospective or monograph or something like that, they're kind of of the moment. And certainly that book was a portrait of New Orleans in the early 90s. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so for it to still be chugging along 20 years later is, so, is pretty remarkable. Yeah. Right. Now, how many books do you have out? I'm completing my 13th book now, right. uh, which will be with the Historic New Orleans Collection. Some of them I have conceived. I've done the writing and I've done the photography. In other cases, I've just done the photography for other people's books. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes there have been other collaborators involved, sometimes not. So they all vary, but there have been uh, 13 so far. Can you tell us what the new book's uh, title would be or when it's coming out? Sure. Uh, the new book is uh, called Creole World, and it's coming out in April of next year. There will be an ex exhibit also at Historic New Orleans Collection. And Creole World will uh, combine many of my New Orleans images, some older ones with some new ones, with photographs that I have taken in uh, the Caribbean and Latin America, places that have um, historical connections to New Orleans, or they're visually similar. So I'm weaving together this photo essay of New Orleans, linking it up with places uh, all over the, uh, the, the Latin and Caribbean. Well, they do say that we're the most northern Caribbean city, right? And that's very true, and I think when you look at Creole world, that becomes quite obvious. Right. Well, in, back to uh, photography in general, what would you say are challenges for an up-and-coming uh, photographer artist or an artist in photography 
today, right now? Well, I, there are a lot of them, I think. Um, first of all, you're sort of entering photography at a time when there's been a lot of change in the technology behind it. So uh, that's, that's one thing to be prepared for. Uh, the second thing is media is changing very rapidly. We're talking about when I came along decades ago, first getting interested in photography and how important the big picture magazines were at that time. Well, now there are far less of them. Uh, the number of people that are subscribing to them is far less. And the ones that cover these broad topics with major multi-paged photo essays, they're not following that model so much anymore either. So I think you've got to be quite creative and, and maybe more of a self-starter. And, and um, in my day early on, you would uh, pound the pavement, you would go in and meet with art directors at the major magazines and hope that they would hire you. And they were the ones full of the ideas. They would say, you know, we really like your work, we've got this story that we're doing on thus and such and we think you'd be perfect for it, here it is. And um, so off you'd go. Right. And if you did it well, you'd, you'd kind of get a reputation for that, and there might be a lot more of those. I don't think that's happening like it did uh, in the past. I think you kind of have to have the ideas and come in and sell them to the magazines, or maybe it's to an art gallery or to, to whomever. I think you've got to be more of a self-starter. Right. Do you see any specific trends developing here in New Orleans for photography? I think New Orleans, for the pretty much the entire time that, that uh, I've been here, which goes back to, as I said, ni 1991, New Orleans photography has been more about fine art photography than media photography. New Orleans is not a huge city. It's not a major publishing center for, for magazines or books. And, but it is a, is a big art city. Mm -hmm. So I think that's always been kind of the direction that I think has been uh, the, the, the major force with local photographers. Well, we also have Photo NOLA here now, which is a big deal. And, uh, yes, very big deal. That, that seems to be taking a life of its own and creating some opportunities for, for uh, photo journalists, photo artists, uh, artists in general. Yes, for a wide range of photographers. And it is making people from outside of New Orleans more aware of what's going on here, too, which is also good. Do you have anything um, beside the book coming up, any shows in a gallery, museum? Well, uh, there will be shows in conjunction with the release of Creole World, and the Historic New Orleans Collection exhibit will travel also. Then Terra Incognita, a project that I mentioned previously that has been traveling since 2007, it's going to uh, two museums in Florida. Uh, it's traveling, so I'm, I'm probably going to be doing about a total of with Creole World, there's going to be the the, uh, the major exhibit and then uh, three private gallery exhibits based on that work, and then the two museum exhibits of uh, Terra Incognita. So the, I'll, I'll probably be busy with five shows next year, which is pretty good for me. Okay, well, cool. We'll, we'll have to all keep our eyes open and, and look for you in all these different venues. And, and Richard, thank you so much for coming in today. It's been a pleasure. Um, I hope to see you soon. Okay, great. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And we're going to take a break, and we'll be right back. In the search for beautiful people, music that moves, and real culture, America, there's only one L.A. coast. Go Coast, Louisiana delivers the treasures of the Gulf fresh to you. I think we need a bigger boat. Sundays at 8.30 p.m. on LAE. You're watching WLAE, New Orleans Public Television. Find us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. Welcome back. We're joined now by my very good friend, Deanne Martin of Windsor Fine Art. Deanne, thank you for being in today. Thank you so much for having me, Steve. It's, it's always great to see you, and I, I want to jump right in and start talking about you in the gallery. Okay. So um, tell us a lot about Windsor Fine Art. Well, Windsor Fine Art was established in 2001, 
uh, Jack Bosma um, came in from San Francisco and opened it in, originally in the 300 block right. of Royal Street. 2003, we moved into the, the 200 block of Royal. And, um, you know, we specialize in mostly the modern masters, the masters, Rembrandt, Durer. Right. Uh, and that's what sets you apart and makes you a special gallery there. Yeah, there's, um, there's a few galleries on Royal Street, you know, that, that house the same type of works as we do. I think that we may have more of a vast collection of it because works on, on paper are our specialty. Right, you have a very in-depth collection of uh, Salvador Dali. A very, very, um, very high end. Um, the provenance on the pieces are impeccable too. We get them from the Argelet Museum of Surrealism in France, mm -hmm. which is a museum that Pierre Argelet founded in 1939. And he had befriended all the surrealists at right. that time. He was a passionate about the surrealist movement, whether it be filmmakers, poets, artists. And he and Dali became friends in the um, 30s, and in 1960, after decades of friendship, Pierre commissioned him to do a series of works on paper, etchings and also originals, right. uh, watercolors, inks. And so from 1960 to 1972, Dali worked for Pierre, right. um, mostly Pierre Argelet and created this body of work that is now considered by our critics the best collaboration between artist and publisher ever done on plate. Well, Dali was such an interesting uh, interesting character with the mustaches yes. and his uh, very whole eccentric. persona. He made movies. He had a very broad uh, scope of work that, honestly, if you very look at prolific. his early work, it had a lot of uh, the same feel as Picasso did. But some of my favorite work that he did is the dry point and the etchings that you carry, or, or the work that he's um, yes. doing well, what, on paper. What a lot of people don't um, know is that um, he did all his own etchings. He worked right into the plate himself with the dry point needle. And he would most, after he would ink the plates, he would hand color them often time and pull right. the prints, whether it be on Japanese pearled paper or arches paper. And Dali, there's a lot of lithographs out there that are wonderful lithographs, authentic pieces that were transcribed from his original works onto right. stone, pulled and signed by Dali and so forth. But he never actually worked on lithographic stone. Let, let's talk about that particular thing for a minute because okay. um, in printmaking, a lot of people get confused between what a serigraph is, what a lithograph is, what a aquatint is, what a dry point is. You know, yes. there's different facets. Uh, G clays are now very popular yeah. in, in, in because it's a, a reproducible uh, right. uh, uh, medium, silk screens, things like that. Well, and you, reproduced is the term that I want to elaborate okay. on a little bit because I think what pe people get confused when you say it's a fine print. Uh, Rembrandt worked in, in copper plate with a very small needle, and mm -hmm. as you know, and he would etch into the copper plate and dip the plate in acid and then ink the plate and pull it through an old time press. Those are original prints. They are not reproductions. And, and as I, old as they are, they were still done by the artist's hand. They were still done by the artist's hand. And most of the, the pieces that we have in our collection are 17th century lifetime impressions. Mm -hmm. However, we have some posthumous impressions as well, which means after the artist's lifetime. The plate was worked on during his lifetime. However, the the, pay, the it may have been pulled after his death. Mm -hmm. It's a posthumous impression, but you can have 18th, 19th century impressions that were pulled that are as, as valuable as some 17th century, depending on condition, rarity of the piece. Right. Um, so you have starting with etchings, then the modern masters and the impressionists began right. to work on lithographic stones. So so Dolly did etchings and dry point. Rembrandt, who you carry, did the etchings. Uh, Miro, I think you carry some. Absolutely. And he did aquatints and, aqua and work on stone. Lithographs. Um, and an aquatint is when you do the work on the stone or, or, or a plate, and then they put sugar over the plate and put the plate over, you know, fire. Mm -hmm. So it bubbles. You know, the right. heat makes it bubble and makes these pockets into the plate. So then when the color's applied, it almost looks like a watercolor and okay. there's some texture to it. It's very interesting. Um, how about lithographs, seriographs? 
Um, lithographs done on lithographic stone, which mm -hmm. is limestone, natural substance of the earth, and a waxy substance um, similar to a crayon right. is used to create the artwork. Different, different stones are used for different colors. It's a very tedious process because you have to pull and then apply to another stone and pull and so forth. Right. And, um, and like I said, you can either use like a Japanese pearl paper, arches paper, and that's lithographs. Mm -hmm. uh, the Impressionist um, did a lot of lithographic work. Renoir right. has a lot of lithographs out right. there. Picasso, you know, the, mo the modern masters as well. Um, and then you go into serographs, which most people know who Andy Warhol is. Right. And he did the silk screening process, which is called serograph. Right. And this is all still the artist working. This is all creating. the artist work. I think people are a little. Um, hesitant sometime if they're not educated mm -hmm. on the uh, history of printmaking uh, because they feel like, oh, it's, it's, but it's a print, it's a reproduction, right. it is not. It's from the hand of the artist. It is from the original piece of, of the plate or the stone that the artist worked on right. and pulled. Now, Jaclaise, mm -hmm. that is, is a reproduction. That's machine printing. It's it's a, a piece of equipment called, it's like a computer, a large printer, an iris machine. And what the artist will scan his original artwork, his original oil, like your beautiful artwork that you do. Say, for instance, you scanned it. Mm -hmm. And then you would input the data, just like a, a printer, and there's seven ink jets. And a canvas or paper is wrapped around this large drum, and then it's printed out. These seven in, ink jets, right. you know, create this piece of... Um, work and it's a clay but you know it's it's signed by the artist and, and it allows an and entry point for for someone that that maybe doesn't have the money to pick up an original that can right. buy something that they like and, and it's put more it affordable the, right okay well um tell us about how people can find you and maybe anything that you have upcoming as far as shows well i do want to say that and i know that you've seen it we redid the gallery beautifully yes. um uh, beautiful flooring and and we're also adding some new artists some contemporary artists which is very exciting yeah. so we are going to still always offer the fine master prints right. but we're also transitioning into even more contemporary work as you know we have Jose Basso the Chilean mm -hmm. artist right. now I have this fabulous artist Nick Patton okay. um, I hope that you and well, everyone okay. comes down to see his works they're absolutely stunning and we are at 221 Royal Street, right, right across the Monteleon. Like okay. I've said before, take so a spin around the, the carousel, <laughs> carousel bar, right, and then and then come see me. And um, we have, um, you know, a few people in there that are very knowledgeable: Doug Benny, Jack Bosma, Tracy right. Riggin, who is our administrator, and myself. And now you have a show that's going to start on October twelfth and <gasps> run through November ish. Yes, November sixteenth is. Um, it's called Intellectual Expressionism. And I've combined um, Dada artist mm -hmm. with surrealist. And um, so it's Dali, of course. I have Dali tapestry, some Dali original watercolor and inks, Hans Belmer, uh, George, uh, Giorgio Di Carico, and uh, Leonor Fini, mm -hmm. uh, Kadinsky, okay. and uh, Hans Art. Okay, and so it's going to be a very interesting show. Well, I hope everybody can take it. A, a time out and go down yeah. and, and experience the gallery because it's really good. And Dee Dee, thank you so much for coming in. Thank it's always you a pleasure. so much for having me, Steve. I really appreciate it. I'm, I'm glad to do it. Thank you. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back with more Made in New Orleans. Hi, we're Ola High, and you're watching WLAE TV. That's all the time we have tonight. I'm Steve Martin. Thanks for watching us and be sure to join us next time on Made in New Orleans. Made in New Orleans is underwritten by Art Plus Design Magazine, New Orleans Auction Galleries, and New Orleans Living Magazine.